The Savannah River Nuclear Landfill is a facility that stores, decontaminates, and processes radioactive waste. It is located in South Carolina, near the Savannah River, 40 kilometers from Augusta, Georgia. It was built in the 1950s, originally as a plant to generate, enrich and purify radioactive materials for nuclear weapons production. All of the reactors that serve this purpose are now shut down, with some of the facilities used for the storage of radioactive materials. Savannah River is operated by the U.S. Department of Energy, but all work is performed by a private contractor. The facility covers 800 square kilometers and employs over 10,000 people. Volatile organic compounds, especially trichloroethylene (TC) and tetrachloroethylene, have been used extensively at SRS as degreasing agents. TCE is one of the main substances contaminating groundwater throughout the complex. Fish contamination. Fish bioaccumulate certain elements, especially cesium-137 and mercury. By the mid-1950s, it became apparent that SRS activities were affecting fish in the Savannah River. The fish here contain 3,000 times more cesium than the water itself. According to the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, mercury regulations protect against cesium-137 as well. A 1996 survey conducted by Morris, Samuel and students at Benedict College found that people fish near the SRS outlet reservoirs whose water is contaminated. According to the survey, people eat more than 50 pounds of fish a year from this river. Thus, reducing the pollution of the Savannah River caused by the SRF represents a critical aspect of environmental justice, as well as protecting the health of all those who depend on the river for their sustenance and for whom it is an important source of protein. So-called environmental remediation More than 99% of the radioactivity in SRS waste is in high-level waste. Just 1% of this amount, about 4.2 million curies, was extracted from tanks, mixed with molten glass and cast as glass blocks at a military waste recycling facility. The 1,221 cast glass blocks are now stored in alloy steel containers on the compound in a temporary high-level radioactive waste storage facility. In the long term, they should be buried in deep geological repositories. The Department of Energy has not yet decided how to bury this entire mass of waste. The original plan was to recycle the waste, remove the main radionuclides, and vitrify the radioactive substances. It was proposed to mix the remaining liquid waste with cement and dispose of it on the site, turning it into a so-called salt stone. But this plan encountered serious technical difficulties. The original method was abandoned in 1998. The main problem was that the residual waste was producing benzene, a flammable toxic gas whose presence in the tanks created the risk of fires in the radioactive waste. In 2002, the Department of Energy decided to apply to the 49 facilities the same procedure that had already been used to close the other two filling them with cement mortar after the bulk of the waste had been removed. In fact, this closure, Tank 19, is an example of the incompetent, illegal, and dangerous approach of eliminating contamination by dilution. It has been estimated that the concentration of radioactivity in the residual waste from this tank is more than 14 times the acceptable standards for Class C low-level radioactive waste, which includes most of the radioactive waste to which near-surface disposal is permitted. Class C standards are violated for each of the four radionuclides separately, plutonium-238, plutonium-239, plutonium-240, and americium-241. Thus, the residual radioactive substances in this tank belong to the above class C waste class or, in other words, to the transuranic waste of the type that normally requires disposal in deep geological repositories. But if the residual waste from this tank is diluted with a huge amount of cement slurry, the closure documentation for Tank 19 estimates that the radioactivity of such waste would be 0.997 of the Class C limit value, which would fit into the Procrustean bed of the current low-activity waste standards. The remaining tanks to be emptied contain even more radioactivity than those that have already been emptied. Given that estimates of residual radioactivity are increasing, cementing residual waste into more than 50 tanks of high-level waste could result in several hundred thousand or even millions of curies of radioactivity remaining in them. That's a huge number. In the long run, it would pose a serious danger to groundwater and surface water, including the Savannah River. 
plutonium is also a concern. The empty tank 19 is estimated to contain 30 curies of plutonium-239 and nearly 11 curies of plutonium-240. The total amount of plutonium in this tank alone is almost half a kilogram. The residual radioactivity of even 1 to 2 percent of this amount gives a huge level of plutonium alpha radiation, not counting other radionuclides. This situation is dangerous and poses serious risks to future generations. High-Level Waste the Department of Energy was even considering leaving the most highly radioactive waste, HLW, at the SRS production complex. Recycling HLW is currently the only costly element of the Environmental Management Program. Its goal is to find a way to eliminate vitrification for at least 75% of the planned waste and to develop at least two reliable cost-effective strategies for all types of high-level waste on the complex. In an effort to circumvent the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, which requires deep geological disposal of high-level radioactive waste, the Department of Energy attempted to call the waste not high-level radioactive but incidental waste. This ploy was thwarted by a federal court in 2003. Even if this practice is found legal by the courts or legalized by new legislation, it will not make it safe. Carrying out the disposal of so many long-lived radionuclides near water is dangerous and would pose a serious and largely unpredictable threat in the future. Buried Waste Disposal of transuranic waste on the SRS territory was carried out in the 1970s, and the near-surface disposal of low-radioactive waste is still carried out today. A huge area of 78 hectares is set aside for this purpose, the so-called Waste Disposal Facility, where mixed radioactive and hazardous non-radioactive wastes are dumped. The purpose of the surface backfills is to reduce water seepage and hence infiltration of contaminants from the disposal site into the groundwater. This method cannot restore already contaminated groundwater. Vegetation that is planned to be planted on top of the burial sites increases evapotranspiration and therefore can reduce water infiltration. But vegetation also reduces surface water runoff and therefore can increase water infiltration in some cases. In any case, backfill is a short-term half-measure, not a long-term effective solution to the problem. We do not yet understand very well how the interaction of physical, chemical and biological processes leads in the long term to the spread of radionuclides in the environment. For example, when using clay as a radionuclide barrier, it is assumed that the exchange of ions will bind the metal cations contained in the waste in the soil. However, in real life, in many cases the application of this approach proves to be very doubtful. Regarding biological processes and the spread of radioactivity, there is research on the elimination of radioactive contamination using bacteria that concentrate radioactive substances. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.